Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Ilham. As part of our Music at Ilham series, we are delighted to welcome two very special guests. Paul Augustine is a music historian, author, and founder of the Penang House of Music. Paul is also the festival director of the very successful Penang International Jazz Festival, which is now in its 14th year. Paul Augustine will be sharing his collection of Malaysian vinyl music from the 1950s and 60s with us in this very, in this very special session moderated by Daryl Go, who is a journalist, DJ, and, and a music enthusiast. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Paul Augustine and Daryl Go. Hi, I'm Daryl, and um, this is Mr. Paul Augustine, our <laughs> director of uh, Penang House of Music. I'm, I'm just going to go briefly into uh, why we're here. Uh, I talked to Paul about uh, this exhibition. Uh, it was this, uh, this great exhibition is about the 60s and the, uh, the group artists and all that. So we're talking about whether we can uh, kind of complement it with uh, a little bit of what was the music uh, of that generation. So we kind of timeline it to the kind of mid 50s and maybe towards the uh, mid 60s. Right? Mm. And because uh, somebody came up and asked me whether we are playing any uh, 80s pop or 70s rock music. So we are not, the timeline is about, about there, maybe early 50s even because we have some uh, pretty much old recordings of uh, Malaysian music. From uh, recorded by our colonial masters. <laughs> okay, and, um, the uh, whole idea of this exhibition is to uh, to uh, ask Paul whether he could pick out. Um, okay, hang on, what? The Penang House of Music was formed in uh, November 2016. It's uh, up at the Comta Building, and it's a resource center for uh, local music. Most most of it centered on Penang-based artists, but uh, Paul has basically slowly expanded into uh, looking at other parts of Malaysia. So I told Paul whether he could uh, come by to, to Kuala Lumpur and basically present uh, his discoveries on vinyl of uh, any, any interesting uh, records that basically was not so May, I mean, not so mainstream, and uh, I think who need a little bit more of attention. Like, uh, we're not going to go into the P. Ramleys and the Salomas and all that, but uh, there'll be a lot more beyond that, which I think Paul will want to share. So, I mean, I will let Paul uh, handle the uh, vinyl selections. Okay, very good evening. Uh before I start, I think it's thank you to Ilham for getting having us here and doing this thing. And basically, it's the first time I'm doing something like that. But I think I need to tell a bit of a background of, of how we started by getting all these other things. So I will talk about the Penang House of Music very fast, Pecha Kucha style, 20 seconds. Actually, we started from the Penang Island Jazz Festival. We were 14 years. And during the Penang Island Jazz Festival, we had an exhibition inside. And in the exhibition, what we did was we started collecting personality profiles. Because I was a musician growing up. And though I had my international heroes, I had my local heroes as well. And we found that a lot of people do not know who these local heroes were, so we started doing it for fun. And we collected, eventually, it developed into an exhibition in Penang. The Penang State uh, uh, Gallery came and said, you know, can we do something? And we said, okay, we'll do 40s and 50s. It was quite easy because a lot of people have died. Oh, you know, so it, there's only a small group of people, so you don't have to do a lot of work. It was very successful, and then we had to do the 60s one. This one took us like a year to put together a lot of research. We went out looking for things, and then we invited, and a lot of people turned up. Um, some of them have not seen each other for 30, 40 years. We invited all the home musicians. We filled up 11 rooms. And from this, the governor walked around and said, oh, this is very nice, you've got to put it in the book. It's easy to say. Exhibition, you just show pictures. So, you know, but book is different, you got to write facts, so we had to do a lot more research. So we got a lot of pictures. These are municipal bands that perform. These are some of the old photos that we've got in 1940s, Ellen, you know, Ellen Leong and his Hawaiian Islanders. And, they have, and just the, the stories behind the photos itself was very interesting. 
Alan Leong was a pilot. He flew his plane all over Penang. One day he went over Muka Head and never came back. You know, it's like the the jazz artist himself. And this is of uh, Joe Rosell's when Penang first had had uh, T television and they took part. Out of five of them, only one is left alive. And this, when we went into the 60s, if you look at the bottom right here, the guy there is actually David Arumugam from Alley Cats. That's how small he was, you know, that kind of thing. So we accumulated everything and eventually it came into a book. And then from the book itself, we were asked to put up Penang House of Music, but we didn't want it to be only about music. It had to be about lifestyle, it had to be about changes in history, fashion and everything. So it was the sights and the sounds and stories of basically Penang, because Penang, a lot of Penang musicians contributed to Malaysia itself. And that's our place now. And this is what we have inside. We have a resource center, we have a cinema room, we have magazine racks, we have a collection of old, uh, what do you call that, uh, vinyls, record, recordings. We have a recording studio that we created. It's a live listening booth. We have VR and a listening chair and also old radios. It was not just about vinyls, but it was all the whole thing itself. And while doing that, we went looking, and these are some of the things we had to go and go through. Lah. How do you stop this thing? Eh? It keeps going by itself. Uh, it was not easy because then you have to find out what you want. And we had to start looking and it was very difficult. And when, when, when Daryl said, no, come, we do this one, I said, okay, la, let's do But how are we going to do it? And for weeks on end, we had to think about what we got to do. We have so far accumulated 10,000, over 10,000 vinyls. Um, and a lot of it is very interesting. We have not gone through everything yet. And we're still searching for a lot of other things. But every time you play something, something interesting comes out. I think we'll start the session with playing a song from Zainal Alam. Okay. Where is it? Huh? Yeah. Okay, this is Zainal Alam. There were not many Malaysians who recorded during that time, interestingly enough. There were a lot of them who appeared on radio and everything, but not recording. Okay. Hey? Okay, this is not my department. That is Zainal Alam, and it says Malaya Tatap Medika. That means this is prior to. As we search for answers, we look for old things, and actually, what has happened is that a lot more questions have come out. Instead of getting answers, a lot more questions are happening. You know, and getting Zainal Alam 78s are quite difficult. And when I was asking and looking around for it, and one guy came up to me and says, "I got. You want to buy one thousand ringgit?" I'm like, wow. And then it drop, 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 500 ringgit, and then it's like... So, okay, you know, if, because we were, we were supported by the Penang State Government and also the PBA, 
who help us fund this thing. So we had set aside some funds to purchase all these things. So we said, okay. But we paid uh, some for it. Like, I cannot tell you how much. Or not, then I have to kill you. <laughs> then you will come and tell me, yeah, I want this one. I got so much. And I said, how much is it going to cost? Why is it very expensive? Is because Malaysian recordings were very few. Okay, Michael Jackson, Beatles, there are millions of them all over the world. Everybody has. But P. Ramley, maybe about 2,000. You know, they recorded, or maybe 5,000, half of which will be lost. Another half will be under some kampung or under staircase and everything is destroyed. And maybe at the end of the day, you only got about 50 left in the world. So that's why it's very valuable. You know, so Zainal Alam, Zainal Alam did a few recordings. In the end, we managed to get two. But we brought this one. There was another recording that we got. It's called Susu Mambo. But there was a print error. It's called Busu Mambo. I didn't bring that one, you know. Paul's going to introduce you to a uh, um, non-Malay track next. Uh, can I explain more? I'll, I'll, I'll queue it up. Okay, this, this, this track is very interesting because it's actually... Yeah, this side. Uh, there, was a, there was a Taiwanese professor who came to our place and he says, I'm doing research on, on uh, Baba Nyonya in Singapore, Malacca and Penang. And he says, uh, he says, do you all have anything? So we showed him a list of the Chinese things we have. And he went through and he says, okay, I want to listen to this, 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 and the other. So he went back, he came back, and he said, when I come, I want to listen to this. I was sitting in the office, and it was very interesting because he played the track. I don't read Chinese. So it was, on the flip side, it's actually Bangawan Solo, but it's in Kronchong style, but sung in Mandarin. Or, it's done by a Hokkien troupe, apparently. And then when he played this second side, it took me by surprise because I've never heard this version before. And uh, I think we play now, but I think maybe you have to stand up. Okay. The year this one was 1946, between 1946 to 56, circa that. Okay. Seventy-eight. The first time we've been playing it live. It's Kronchong, you hear? You hear the guitar? Do, 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 do. And for your information, the person singing it is not a girl. It's a guy. Okay, it's not a it's not a secret that everybody knows that uh, Negaraku was recorded in many languages, and I think uh, there's always there's also been a research by Saida saying that where it came from and all that. I think that we cannot change because there's history, although people try to do that sometimes. Um, the questions that came out was why was it so popular? Why was this song called Terang Bulan Mamula Moon or Nanning Nights or Nanya Nights and all that? And one of the, the stories that I heard was that because Terang Bulan is because it was used by Bangsawan troops. They used to go to, to, to towns and all that. And at the start of the show, when the, the curtain opens, there's a moon. So it's Terang Bulan, you know, it starts off the show itself. These are all hearsay. We can't really get confirmation on them because some of the people who have the information have died. Some people can't remember. And the person who says anything will say this is the rule, but we can't verify it. So we try to go along. Our, our, 
our, our place here now is basically, we are not academic. We forgot to tell you, <laughs> we are not academic. This is not academic, we are not experts. What we did was we just went to look for stuff and this is what we found. And then we just put it on again, you see? So this one, this is another one that actually was very interesting because it's actually the Nagaraku. Nagaraku has been recorded by police band, we've got the military band, by orchestra and everything. But this one, when it came to us, I decided we have to have this because it's the Merdeka Choir Tony Fonseca uh, singing, but it's accompanied by just one pianist, and that's Tony Soliano, and nobody else, you know? So it could have been the first recording, it could have not, we don't know. But hopefully we'll find out someday. And if it, it is, it, it will be the first recording ever. Sorry. Yeah. Pardon the crackles. Yeah, uh, just pardon the crackles because it's pretty old. So it's just one piano, this one they recorded. It could have been maybe they wanted people to learn the song. There was no orchestration version of it at that time. So it was very interesting for me, especially because we mentioned Tony Soliano. And we have some Solianos here today, you see, sitting that side there. A few stories about how this was formed, the Medica Choir was formed and all that. Uh, when Tunku wanted to do it at the time, he got uh, Ahmad Marika and Tan Sri to go around looking for people to do it. And I think they appointed Tony Fonseca. And he had to get go to all the some churches and community centers to look for all the singers and put them together, which is actually uh, not an easy thing at that time because music lessons were not taught at that time, so people just had to use their ear and learn to sing. Okay, let's move on to something else which is different. This is a recording that we found, and the title of the recording is called Uncle Mutoba. So just by the name itself, we say, hey, got to have this lie, you know. <laughs> and. Uh, it's actually also, nowadays people are trying to do music where they do uh, Malay, Chinese, Indian, Malay and mix it all together. But this was happening in the 50s already. It was already there. You know, they were doing, uh, Uncle Mutaba actually has uh, English and Malay lyrics to it. And it's not a new thing. People like P. Ramlee, Zaino Alam, all of them did that, you know. I think we were more of an open-minded race at the time as well. I can't remember again. Mr. Muhammad uh, Yatim. Yatim did this song. On HMV. On HMV. He mentions, in, in the course of the song, he mentions New World Park. But there are two New World Parks. There was one in Penang and one in Singapore. So we do not know basically which one he's referring to. The possibility it would have been Singapore because I think they recorded mostly in Singapore at this time. So Mr. Motabang. I sound like a DJ, you know. Yeah. Yeah. very funny. Yeah, 
Chinese part of it. Yeah. Okay, right? Okay. Abdullah Cheikh singing Wolare, if you know that one, you know. So this this is the part that we also found out. There's a lot of cover versions that of songs that we took from other places and uh, we put Malay words to it. it it's not, not not something new. Actually, during the war in Penang, when we spoke to some of the musicians that played in clubs, Penang was the only place where the Germans and the Japanese had a base in Southeast Asia, and uh, we, that's why we had German clubs and Japanese clubs. In the Japanese clubs, we're not allowed to play, sing English songs. So a lot of them actually, what they did was they played Western music, but they changed the words to Malay. So, you know, it's not something that, that we did. But not only English songs that we took over and put words to it. Here's another song that was done by actually um, Salma Ismail, otherwise known as Saloma. The people with Filipino background will know this song. Thank you. 
That was Dahil Sayu. Actually, we only discovered this about a couple of weeks ago. As we have collected over 10,000 vinyls now, and slowly we're still documenting it. It's a process that takes a lot of time because you can only do real-time transfers for this. And some of, the, some of the records we got are really, really bad. So we have to clean it up, we have to wash it, you get to you know, do proper things with it and then find covers for it. Then after that, you got to document it and see what kind. And this one, this, the, the one that we just played was interesting because it's called Dahil Sayo, which actually every Filipino knows that song. And um, it, it's called Karana Kau Impian Ku. But uh, I didn't know it when, when I was looking at what to bring down and I played this thing in our office and I'm like, eh, I know this song, I know this song. And I said, wow, you know. And when, when you do things like that, it actually grabs you because you're discovering things every single day. Something comes up and you're like, you know, it suddenly grabs you all the time. Next, okay, we'll play this song. was actually recorded in Italy in 1962-63 by a guy called David Ng. David Ng was from Penang. He's a pianist. He's the one that's singing the song. Um, he left Penang in 1954. He went over to, to Europe in London and he did some work down there. And it actually was very interesting because he maintained, if you look at the essence of the song and the texture, it's very Asian, very Malaysian style still. It's the the people actually what they do this is this is, they recorded many songs he went on a tour with the three other english guys called the four saints and it was for a summer tour but it lasted many years they appeared in shows with frank sinatra you know and some other people as well he was good friends with errol garner people like you know count Basie and all these people as well good afternoon mr reiner <laughs> uh, and sadly enough, he was one of the best. He was a big, jolly man, man. And he played a mean piano. And uh, sadly, he passed away. And we found, after our search, it took us right up to Italy, to London. In the end, we found many, many recordings of him. Even one of him speaking in Italian. But these are things that are very important, I think, that you know, a lot of people do not know about David Ng. Yeah, we've got, we've actually, this is about collection and we've got loads of stuff, you know, basically. And we've got, this is from the Royal Malay Regiment. I don't handle propaganda, so. <laughs> That they put me in. Or?
I was interested in this album because I mean I told Paul to bring down all kinds of stuff, but uh, trying to try to bring down some military stuff, and uh, in particular this one is called the uh, the Central Band of the Royal Malay Regiment. It was interesting to me because uh, this band was uh, reformed in 1940, 1946, and uh, they were actually they, these were all uh, the, the first Royal Malay Regiment that fought against the Japanese, and uh, they. You know, after the uh, after the British, came, I mean, they of course they surrendered, and uh, whatever was left of the, uh, the this regiment, after after the war, the British came back and got 58 Malay Malay guys to basically form this uh, band. So this is one of the first uh, marching band, military band records in uh, Malaysia. But it's also nice to know that the recording is actually quite good. Um, and the band was quite good itself. And they played a lot of Malaya, Malayan songs. That was the focus on a lot of things there. There was a lot of patriotism, everything. We go number eight. This is what number? Seven. Eight. Okay, got it. Eight, okay. Um, that would be so far. We've heard from Johnny and Johnny Jules from Holland. We've heard from Millie from the UK, from Kingsman in America. And right now we're going to get a young singer who has recorded some Malayan songs for us. And uh, another two or three of the songs on Sunday's latest EP are by the name of um, by Jimmy Boyle. Jimmy, if you're listening to this, hold tight because uh, this is getting the first airing over the station here. This track one from side one of Sandra's new EP, some little more Jimmy Boyle, Putra Putri. <laughs> At this point, I'd like to talk about Jimmy Boyle. Of course, a lot of people know about him as a composer. Hey, how do you stop this thing? As a composer and Putra Putri. And uh, what this was, why this was important to us was because it was a recording that we took from a radio station. And it was the guy announcing the first recording of, first airing of the song that he, the Putra Putri song recorded by Sandra Rimmer in Holland, you know, and uh, at that time, it was also a few people in Holland recording Malaysian songs. So, you know, we went beyond our shores. That means the composers were recognized outside of Malaya. And uh, I think we should be proud of that as well. However, the next track that I'm going to play is that a lot of people have heard about Jimmy Ball, the composer. They heard about Jimmy Ball and his music and everything, but how many people have lived that time uh, and heard Jimmy Boyle play. I'm not asking for hands up, but I know there are a few. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, track number nine. You know, um, play. This is Jimmy Boyle playing a solo number, a pianist himself. A song gendering, very beautiful number.
I, uh, when I first heard the song, we were doing a book, we were writing a book, and then the, in, the, in the book there we had to put a, a list of songs of CDs, a lot, list of songs on the CD. And uh, when, when you do that, you put first song, second song, third song, and then you put in the car and you drive around, and then you say, no, I'll change this song and all that. And what touched me a lot about that song was the way that, you know, as you're driving around and you have that one song, it runs for about four minutes. And you're watching the scenes as you drive around Malaysia and Penang. I was driving in town and all that, and it just fit exactly what the song was all about. It was like the scenery, it was like a documentary, watching a documentary, I said, wow. Try that, put that in your car and just drive around and see how it looks. Like drive slow, I don't drive fast. <laughs> That's right, you know. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful song. Okay. Yeah, we yeah we go now into Radio Malaya stuff, and um, this one is a 1964 Radio Malaya Radio Malaysia recording. What 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 is also very nice is that we had awesome covers, man. I thought this is like wow, you know, Griffin Hendroff, you know. And after that, we found out that he did quite a number of covers. This was his, and I think this was a. This was an earlier one that he did, in 1961. It's very dark. Maybe at the time they didn't have flashlight, so but you know it's very nice. You know it gives the mood. That's a Radio Malaya recording. This one, the songs are very long. You tell them where, you guess where this is. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Can you all guess where this is? Uh, where this place is? Well, the people who know, like you know. Lake Garden, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think he waited for the night and then the water, the, you know, the, the light itself. Just play the first song. Okay, we'll just play the first song. It's all about jazz, man. <laughs> Yes. And I'd like to bring your attention that this one is actually an old traditional song. The arrangement is by Mr. Alfonso Soliano, Malaysia's greatest arranger, com conductor, in our books actually, in my books actually. Alfonso played a very, very big part in, 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 in the history of Penang's music. And I think that we don't pay enough uh, acknowledgement and to his contribution to our music, you know, to Malaysian music, Malayan music itself also. Yeah, there is a story of Soliano's. You talk to the auntie there, she'll tell you. <laughs> okay, this is Radio Malaya. This was actually four songs that were given. It's actually uh, Malam Irama Melayu. You know, uh, evening of Malay music. The people that are down here, actually, the greats of that time, there were Alfonso Soliano, there was Charles Lazaru, Jimmy Boyle. You know, all of them came together to do this this night that was put together. Play the wedding songs, uh. the okay, like you said, the, the Sanding Suite. Time flies when you're having fun. We've got 10 minutes more. Ah, the stress is finishing. <laughs> you know, it's not easy when you come out, you think to yourself what you want to play. Actually, we had so much stuff that I don't think that we need 
we, we will need at least another couple of hours to go through. There's so much that we've covered. Yeah. Uh, okay, this one we'd like to touch on Charlie Mariano. Charlie Mariano came to Malaysia to work with the, the Radio Malaysia RTM in 1967. Before he came, uh, no, the other side. Before he came, actually, uh, Ahmad Marikan went over to Berkeley and then he became friends with Herb Pomeroy. And Herb came down to work with the band for a little while. Then after that, eventually, he went back. And then uh, they called Charlie Mariano came. Charlie Mariano, if, if you're a jazz musician or people who like jazz, look him up. He's actually one of the greats. And he was here in Malaysia. And he has a very nice story about when he came, where he stayed, and then uh, he went to temples, he went to listen to music, who the people he met. There is a biography about him. Dendang Mayang. This song will fit this album. Definitely fit this album. It's a different era of Asian music. <laughs> 'm recording yeah okay that's an RTM recording exactly by the RTM combo but they really had good musicians man wow and it's not available on CD so if you want the song come and see me da -da -da. you know um, I don't know whether we have much time left did they go to chase us out what did I go through already? Okay, let me just go back a little while. Can I talk about this for a while? We have the Medica Choir. Medica Choir was actually formed by Tony Monseca. And this was one of the, 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 I only have two, I don't have three. They have three, but I only have two copies of, uh, two of, of this series number two and series number three. What was interesting is that all the songs they got, they've got the lyrics inside has got Malay, English, and Chinese. You know, and they name it with different kinds of, you know, they had their own translation of what the song was. And some of it is really funny. This was what we want. This were the, the, some of the songs that we played on CD because we did not, do not have it on vinyl. So a lot of them was not recorded. It was from radio stations. We got it from reel to reel. Um, we got it from, I think, a lot of people that sent us. This was some of the albums that we, we played just now, you know. And uh, okay, one other thing I'd like to play is actually, I go back to Jimmy Ball because I thought that he was one of the greatest composers that we ever had. And his, this was his, this was his actually favorite thing that happened. This was like the thing that he worked all his life was. He was a man on a mission. He was actually trying to live. He died at the age of 51, 49 or 51, somewhere around there. And um, he was always trying to catch up, play catch up to do something. And this is, this is a tone poem of which he was very proud of because it was recorded of his song Putra Putri by an orchestrated version arranged in a very classical style.
Pastor. This thing runs for 20 minutes. Actually, it's, uh, it was actually uh, when, when the thing was transferred first time and the first time I listened to it was actually at 12 o'clock at night and I had my headphones on and I listened to it. And when the time it finished time, my hair stood on ends. And I like, wow, this orchestra is so good. And then it's Jimmy Ball's tone poem. And I thought, which European orchestra played this? But actually, if you look at Jimmy, one thing about Jimmy was good is that he wrote down things. He documented things quite a bit. So you could refer to where this thing came from, what, how it happened, when was it recorded. And it was, by, it was recorded in Dewan Basar and Pustaka. You know, by a local orchestra. And it's like, wow, not bad, huh? Malaysians. Not bad. Okay. okay. Which one you want to play? This, this one is the curious one. Okay. I'm very curious about this one. 45, I don't forget yeah. to put in the sound. Uh -huh. okay. It's curious, so he's got to talk about it. Um, when Paul pulled this seven inch out, it was called uh, Malaysia Forever. And it was done by this uh, school called the Marymount Vocational School. No, where is the, the school again? I don't know, Singapore. It could be a Singaporean school. But uh, it's, uh, basically, it was Tunku. It's a, the back cover had uh, Tunku basically, uh, basically giving a message out that uh, he was very happy that the Marymount Vocational School Choir was uh, coming out with a recording. And uh, this was when. Uh, Malaysia was coming together, Malay, Malaya, Sarawak, North Borneo, Brunei, and I don't know why Brunei is in there though, but uh, maybe they pulled out last minute. <laughs> well, <laughs> of any, yeah, the song is just called uh, Malaysia Forever, and uh, I just wanted to play it because uh, it's, it's a kid's choir, but I mean, it's kind of like, a, it's relevant because it was the voice of young Malaya, I guess. same boat. If we had Brunei, maybe all in the same planes. <laughs> I think we've come to the end of the session already. I think even my slides also, I didn't do anything. Okay, la. This is what we have. All the other things that we have that we didn't bring. There were many more, but this is some of the things that we're just showing. Uh, I think to close the, the session, we will play a song that was written by Tan Sri Ahmad Marikan. The 11. Yeah. And uh, this was a song that was recorded by Bing Slamat. And I think, I, we, I think this version is very nice. It's like the late, uh, late 50s, 60s kind of thing. Spy you know? movie. Spy movie, spy movie.
pusat kan? Yang paling sama di seluruh Indonesia kan? Indonesia Oh, that was a uh, Bing Slamat, an Indonesian singer. The song by uh, Ahmad Marikan from Penang. It, that closes out our session with uh, Mr. Paul Augustine from uh, Penang House of Music. Uh, but before we go off to the Q and A, I uh, would just like to uh, I mean, look back on these records that we were playing today. I mean, I know that we did, we really didn't have much time to uh, get the entire truck of like ten thousand records down to Kuala Lumpur, but we've I think this is a brief overview of what's happening in uh, the Penang House of Music. Uh, there's a lot of useful resource if you're into music or history. I mean, be it anything else. I mean, even like uh, album covers, which I was very interested in. Uh, there's lots to discover if you basically pay a visit to the Penang House of Music. And uh, also, I was talking to Paul about collecting. I mean, what is he actually uh, collecting? And uh, so for the first part of the q and I get to ask the first question. I've always wanted to know because uh, when, when, since November 2016, we're starting from ground zero. There was no records in the, uh, the Penang House of Music. So I want to ask you, Paul, uh, when you first start, started collecting records, like, what sort of, uh, where, we, what do you leave behind and what do you take? I mean, uh, what were the um, three factors to a record that you, you would salvage? Uh, ask me three factors. One really is okay. Um, we, uh, we are not collectors, so and uh, collectors per se, or we are not in this for the business. We are here to document and to try and save whatever it is to preserve things that are Malaysian. And so, therefore, the first thing you look for is actually the Malaysian factor of it, you know. And then uh, you look at the period, the time period. And the third thing is that if I've never seen it before, it's like wow, you know, it's got to be something good, la. And um, we have met a lot of people, even even not only not only recordings but posters, people with posters or photographs. We met a guy who had actually a lot of posters, and he said, you know, oh, I got all his posters, you know, and he shows it to me, and I said, wow, you know, and he says it's mine. He doesn't want to show it. I said, but if you don't keep it, nobody's going to know. After you die, your children will not care, and they'll just throw it away and be gone. But if you give it to us, we don't take it. We don't sell it, but we, what we do is we scan it, we keep a copy of it, we give it back to you. Because we want to preserve what it was. You know, I, I don't want to say that this is what we own, unless the things that we bought, then it's all donated to us, then we, it's ours, you see? So I think there are some people, it's like I have the Mona Lisa I put in my house, I got the Mona Lisa, I know, hey, you got, you come, you're my friend, you come and see lah. But if you're not my friend, you cannot come. But then, you know, it's not the truth, we, we don't operate that way. When we, when we did the book called Just for the Love of It, and then uh, we were asked, what are you going to do with all the thousands of photographs, the recordings you got and all that? It would be very easy for us to just to put it in university or college or somewhere and, and just leave it there and say, done. But we said, no, it was so hard for us to gather the information. I had to sit at coffee shops every day, you know, every morning, uh, and listening to the same story every day for like one week, you know. Then they change a little bit here and there, but the hero is always the same. And, you know, if, if it was so difficult for me, what about the younger people? And how are they going to, how are they going to know? Now you come into the international age, in internet age and you've got YouTubes, you've got everything on hand. Before that, the guys, if you listen to all the musicians, they did not have instruments, they had no music schools, they have no record players, they have no film, no nothing. How did they learn to play? How did they hone their skills? What made them so good? And they are not less than any of the musicians today. They are really, really good, you know? It's like uh, the, the people become technically very strong when you go to a school, but you lose the soul of the person. So I hear you talking, you can play a thousand notes, but I don't know what you're saying. With those guys, they just say one thing, and wow, wow this is great. So we listen for that. If you listen to the warmth of the, the records, that's what they have. You know, the soul is still there. I think I talked too much. Huh? Your question was different. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, open the, uh, the floor to questions. Anybody got a question for Paul? For him. For me? No, not for me. Uh, 
Um, I have the book just for the love of it, and it comes with the complimentary CD, right? Yeah. And I, I love, I love that CD so much. I was wondering, um, is the Penang House going to compile more compilations and make that available to the public to buy? I mean, do you guys have the rights to do that and stuff? <laughs> yeah. Okay. The the CD in the book is that if you look at the book, you buy the book, you get a free CD. Yeah. So we didn't want to sell it as a complimentary because there's a lot of. Uh, Factors we have to go through, copyrights and uh, find out who the singers are, who the writers of the song, the composers and all that. Yes, we have been toying with the idea. We've been toying with the idea of putting things together because a lot of songs that we have, people have not heard. And I think it's, it's great, you know, music is a very strong factor in pushing and making us patriotism, making us believe that we are together as one, making us believe that we are Malaysians. It's very strong. So I think that you know, maybe in time to come, we will do it, but we need to clear the copyright issues and also you know, get... It's always money involved. Like. We don't have a lot of money. We, our, funding finishes in, our funding finishes in July. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. And then after that, we don't know what we're going to do, but we've got all these things, so hopefully we are, we are trying to get some uh, other ways of looking at it, you know, continuing it as... Uh, the other thing is that Penang House of Music, when we first started, we thought, okay, very easy, right? you know. Then you say you go and find somewhere else, you can find, copy, paste, copy, paste. But there's nothing like that in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand. So when we took it on and said, yes, at the time, we had to come up with our own ideas how to do it. So that is one of the things that we want to do, you know, in time to come. Yes, we need to do it. It's not that we want, we need to do it, you know. It would be very interesting. Of any other questions? No. Um, are all these records available for listening at the Penang House of Music? Uh, not at the moment, but what we're doing is that this is our first thing. We wanted to start something last in December actually, and what we wanted to do was call it From the Walt. So we got this bag, you know, so this bag, this cool bag, you know. So what we're going to do is put about 20 records or 30 records every month and we put it there and there people. But there are some of the things that has been digitized so you can listen to it. We've got like about 100 over songs and we've got also a listening chair where you can listen to Dang Dud. No, not Don Dang Sayang, Borea, you know, Inang, uh, Asli and all that kind of stuff. So it's all different areas but we will do something called From the Walk. From here, then after that we will start from in playing House of Music. And if you come, you can cast listen. But in the place, we have a record player, we have a tape recorder, and we have an old radio, which we allow people to touch and play. Other places you go, you cannot touch this, you cannot touch that. But we allow people to do that. So, yes, maybe on time time, but not all. 10,000 means you'll be there every day, man. Forever. Hi, I'm very interested in the way you collect or gather records. So I was wondering, do you, I, I'm sure you don't do it the way a lot of us might, which is, you know, you go to a record store and you randomly find this one thing. So I was curious if you have um, a process or, you know, just a way that you do it, which you find to be systematic, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> There's no system to it, actually, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. You, it, this thing's uh uh, certain things happen. We, we, we still go to the record shops. We go to the record shops, we go, we see something that nobody else likes or nobody else cares. All these things, if we had not had told you the stories behind them, you would not look at them again. You would just walk away. But everyone that has a story, if you tell it at the time, then it becomes interesting to you. Uh, it was word of mouth as well. I went into a few places. There was a guy who had like about a few thousand records. He says, if you want to buy, buy all. Or, you know, you cannot buy just two or three or four. So we said, okay, before we fight, buy all, we had spent two weeks in his house. Two weeks in his house going through all his records. Okay? And then in the end, out of the few thousand, we only wanted maybe about 200. Out of the 200, maybe I wanted only about 20. You know, but the first said, if 20, you pay this amount of money. You buy all, it's this amount of money. So what do you do? You buy all. <laughs> you, know? you take everything, but then you discover so many things inside there. You see, after that, wow, I got this, wow, I got that. And there were times that you, you go to some, there was another guy who wanted to sell a radiogram because 
He's a girlfriend, ex-girlfriend of a friend of mine. His mother has just passed away. So we went there and uh, the radiogram, but then they opened up the cupboard and says, look, we got all these records as well. Do you want? You can take it all. And they were in mint condition. That one was really good. That was really good. You know, so there is no hard and fast rule or system that we go. And uh, my favorite so far has been one uncle that I went to his house. And as you go inside, he has uh, like a, you know, the old buggy, you know, the motor with the, with the horses that you ride, you know, the buggies, like a stagecoach kind of thing. He's got one in his, in his garden. And it's actually originally from Penang. Penang, they used to do that. So he's got, look, I got one. Wow, you know, great. His whole house there outside is full of things. You go inside, you've got only this, this amount of space. And you walk in. It's all stacked from top to bottom. And then he tells me, I got two pianos and an organ. I can't see it. Then you go up into his room. In the toilet, there's things in the toilet. And he's got this big bed. And it's only this one small piece of place that he sleeps. But there's things all around. There's everything. It's not only about, he's got instruments, he's got uh, records, he's got books, and he's got cupboards, anything he takes, you know? And it's, it's very enjoyable when you dig into these kind of things and you find, wow, this is thing. You watch the pickers and you watch, you know, this kind of thing. It's, that's what it was, man. It was wow. I never knew they existed in Malaysia. So there's no system, sorry. <laughs> Have you got a curator in place? A curate? Curator. Uh, for our place yeah. in Penang. Actually, n not a qualified one, you know. Basically, it was me and a few other people that put it together. So we don't really have a curator, uh, but we would love to have one. Okay. If it's not too expensive. La. <laughs> no, th that's the answer I was looking for. You, you like to have one. <laughs> okay. Now, the other thing is you, you weren't quite sure whether the New World is Singapore or Penang. Yes, the one that was sung there. It's the first time I've heard this Murtaba thing. Yeah. And I noticed that it mentioned a Gelang. Ah, yeah. So it must be the, the New World must have Singapore. been Singapore. Yeah. I thought I'd make that comment. Okay, thank you. Because, right. yeah. yeah. Because New World Park was under Shaw Brothers. They opened all these places and all that. And they had one in Singapore, and I didn't pick up the gale. And thank you for telling me, sir. And we have one in Penang as well. So it was actually quite interesting for both places before they went into it. There's also another story about it. There's a cinema area. Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm. You mentioned um, trolley bus. Uh -huh. I know they have trolley bus in Penang. Yes. So Penang. if you check, if there is a trolley bus in Singapore. Yeah. Um, then that new new world is definitely uh, is referred to in Singapore. Yeah. Not not Penang. Okay. Uh, Thank you. You know, you see, that's the one thing you got with records. The time of the records that are played, they sing of the current issues, and of current issues, if you pick it up, you can go back to the place itself. And that helps identify history and heritage as well. So music, you know, music. Okay. Hi. Um, I understand that most studios were in Singapore and Penang, and maybe in KL as well. But were there any recordings from other states of from Malaysia? Okay. This is a very very interesting one. Uh, there were other record companies in Penang, the pirate type of record companies. And uh, I have a friend who told me about this thing that he had that could print records. And he had it and he threw it away. I said, man, I would like to have it. It's like making koi kape, you know? You press the records together and then you got a record and you can release. So a lot of them like uh, Mutiara Records and all the MMI and all that, these are just all over the place. Some of them came from North. I don't know whether Kelantan had any as well. You know, but I'm sure that, you know, it's the lucrative business and if anything that's lucrative, there's always people looking for money, eh? they'll do it. Um, 
hello. I was wondering if you knew the venues that this music was being played in the 1950s, because I think in Singapore, the bands were playing at tea dances and yeah, thank you. Oh, and by the way, there is a trolley bus system in Singapore in that, <laughs> during that time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Singapore, I'm not very clear on a lot there. You know, a lot of music came from Singapore. In the 50s, there were a lot of the, the Filipinos. You see, the Filipinos, let me tell you a story about the Filipinos that I've heard. Uh, they were brought in by the, in the British to supplement the municipal bands of the Strait Settlements, which is actually uh, Singapore, Malacca, Dindings, and Penang. And uh, they brought in all these musicians from Philippines and India. Two, two, two sets of them, and they had contracts with them. This is according to an article I wrote, I read about Alfonso Salerno. And out of 64 of them, 62 of them stayed back because the British gave them the option, you finish the contract, you want to go home, you go home, if not, you stay back. So they stayed back and they continued making Malaysia their homes. That's where we have the Solianos, the Guazos, the Montanos, the Willingis, and all that. They are Malaysian-born Filipinos. And they contributed a huge chunk of music, musicianship to Malaysia itself. They went into Bangsawan, they were in the orchestras, they did all the things. But for venues that did those things, I'm not very sure, uh, Singapore. But I know that in, in, Malay, in, in Penang, I know that it was recorded in uh, school halls. They did a lot of recording in school halls because they were quiet. And then when they came, when Radio Malaya first opened, I think, in <coughs> KL, it was, according to the story I was told, it was at the mock of the KL hospital. So nobody worked after 8 o'clock. <laughs> Everybody went home. This was the story Ahmad Marikan told me. He said, we were there, it was quiet, very nice, you know, by 8 o'clock, everybody go home. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing your collection. If you did this every month, I'd be more than happy to turn up. Just saying. <laughs> um, but my question is, um, for your selection today, what was the process? Um, did you select songs in a particular theme, or did you have something that you wanted to present to us particularly? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, well, I, I kind of like talked to Paul about what he had, and uh, we, were, we were talking about this exhibition per se. So how we could basically uh, complement the. Uh, this exhibition and uh, we were looking at pre Medeca recordings. So we played uh, some of the early uh, nation building stuff and then then he told me to like we put in some pop. So we put the Matabab song and the covers of the uh, and then we went from there. It's, it's actually a very, very imp it's impossible to put everything in in one hour because uh, we even left out all the big names. There was no P. Ramli and all that, right? We said. So, uh, it's uh, like I said, Paul, we should actually do this more often <laughs> because there's just a lot of things out in this Penang House of Music collection which I think it's, it's due time that people found out more about this music. That's what I feel. Paul? What do you think? Yeah. Come back. Come back. I think, yeah, it's true. We had, we actually, we, we, we knew about doing this more than a month ago, two months ago. Yeah. And the process changed through every day. You think about, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. How do I start? You don't know what you want, and you don't know who are the people that are going to come. You don't know whether it will be right or wrong. So we, we decided that I think Daryl said, you know, and last night we were sitting down and said, okay, let's do this. Like, you know, we'll do pre 50s, pre Medeka, Medeka, touch on it, then after that, post. And then we showed a little bit about cover versions done for Malaysia and also the, the languages that were intermingled together. And we showed the musicianship of the the, the musicians of, of Malaysia, Malaya, and also the songs that were actually recorded by other people outside. So we are not, we are actually trying to cover as many areas as we could. And I think we left out quite a bit of it. Or actually, the bag was heavy, you know, but I only played a little bit. <laughs> it would have been easy if we just put a CD. We could have done that. We could have just digitized everything, kind of play a CD, but it's not, not nice. It's nice to show, okay, you know, I'm playing this one, we have a copy of it, that kind of thing. So, uh, we don't know whether it was right, but we hope it was. Another interesting thing, it is a, a small sidetrack, was I, I did contact uh, 
uh, Farida American, uh, who used to work for Radio Malaya in the uh, mid uh, mid fifties. I was very curious to find out about Radio Malaya's uh, playlist back then. What were the young DJs of uh, radio presenters of, of that time? Uh, very, what were they playing? And uh, there's not many of them left. So uh, a guy called George Abraham, which I kind of like uh, knew about, but he passed away two years ago, a few years ago. Uh, these are the people that actually were the pioneers for Radio Malaya. But uh, Farida just told me that uh, back then, they had a free hand to play a lot of uh, whatever they wanted. It's until 12 midnight. So uh, the, uh, her, her take was she played lots of like uh, romantic music of that era. So it's a lot of Nat King Coles and Duke Ellington's and jazz. It seemed to me that uh, jazz was a big thing among that generation of radio presenters. Not so much the big bands. I mean, because I mean, she would have been about 18 years old or 19 years old then. So that was the, the music of her her time, her era. I mean, this just a curious thing. Like, right now, you really won't know this kind of fine details. You know about Radio Malaya's history, but you won't know about the human aspect of who was the jazz DJ and who was the pop DJ or something like that. Yeah, okay. Um, I was just wondering if you have a written catalogue of the collections that you have in Penang House of Music and that you are willing to share with everyone who's in the <laughs> hall today. Okay, we have a website, and inside the website, we have uh, under resource center, we have some of the data put up already. Because it's a whole process that what we do is that uh, we've not put up the recordings itself per se, but we put up what we have in the place, like photographs, uh, what records we have. You know, uh, we're in the process of taking photos and put it there as well. So if you go in there, you can see there are different material types that we have. We have magazines from uh, movie news to, you know, all the kind of stuff, to posters, to old newspaper clippings and all that kind of stuff. It's, so, yes, we do have, and we are, we, the, the reason why we set this up is to share. We don't want to keep it to ourselves because, you know, if I, when, I, when the time comes, if I go, I cannot bring it along with me. It's too heavy. So, you know, um, and we want people to acknowledge the old musicians to recognize them and also to be proud of what they did. And, and in looking back, you can move forward as well. You know, and that's the only thing that we need to do. Ta -da. Um, firstly, thank you for your talk. Um, as an outsider, I'm really curious to know how much the local Malaysian musicians look back at this Eros music and sort of take inspiration from the themes or music. Uh, so how much of this is history and how much of it has it survived nowadays? That's, thanks. Uh, first answer would be not enough, I think. You know, uh, because it's not cool to play old music, maybe. I don't know. But the, the, the beauty about Malaysian songs or songs written by, for Malaysia the melodies are very, very strong of all the songs. If you listen to Malaysian songs, you listen, listen to like Kataran Jiwa, the melodies are very strong, Putra Putri. And uh, I think that if, if the people take it and redo it into their style, it would be something. I run a jazz festival, so I get invited to a lot of um, festival meetings or, or places all around the world. And it's actually very sad when people ask me, hey, can you give me a CD of Malaysian music? And i like, what? What do I have to give that's current? It's very little. You know, you can't, you, you can't pinpoint what you have. So I, I hope that eventually, we're going to start a series called Reflections where we get young people in our Penang House of Music to come forward, take Malaysian songs and do it their own way in the present situations. Do it, do how you like. If you want to rock the song, fine, you know, you want to do a folk version of this song, fine, you know, but at least get it out there, let people know that we have nice Malaysian songs. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Paul, and also to you uh, for this lovely presentation. Uh, you, you mentioned the funding and uh, Imagine you, you suddenly got a, a lot of money, a, a big amount of funding 
what would you do with it? So, or, or in other words, what, is, what would you consider to be most important with regards to the House of Music? Um, where would you take it if you, if you had the funding suddenly? Oh. I would take it home. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the Sorry, way I meant it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Actually, uh, okay, if we had a lot of funding, it would be good. It would help us to keep, a, keep ourselves alive. Uh, because the process that we do is that every day we're thinking about new things to come up and, and make things as, as easily accessible to people and also to share things. With we not only talk about music from the 50s and 60s, but we go way back, whereby it goes into Borea, Bangsawan. We touch also on these areas. And sometimes we get people walking in and giving us photographs or giving us instruments and all that kind of stuff. That is one aspect of it, to keep it going. Uh, the other aspect is research. We need very important, because the resource is only there in this manner. But like Daryl mentioned just now, he spoke to, you know, Farida Marikan about what did they play during Radio Malaya in the, well, 50, 60s or 50s. How do you find out? You need, you need money, you need time to go and do research, go and find out all the things, where was it broadcasted, or you know, find things. And because our, what we can do is we can point the people to tell them where to go and how to write, but we need to pay these people. These people can't just come and say, okay, it's free, man, I'll do it for fun. You know, I did it for fun. Look where I am now, nowhere, you see? <laughs> so, uh, it's... It's a lot of things. I think um, we've covered, when we covered Penang, when we started, we call it Penang House of Music because Penang contributed a lot to Malaysia. You see? So if we say we're going to do a Malaysian House of Music, we die because we don't have enough resources, enough money. You need money to digitize and you've got to have record players. You have to maintain the things. You have to have a, a room to keep all the records properly so that they don't, you know, get mildew and, and it's all the cleaning and all that. So, uh, we, it would go into that and also to create traveling museums or traveling exhibitions that we could come to places and just say okay look I got this you know this is what we are here today not to tell you that our house of music we are here today to tell listen Malaysian music was so great at that time we had so much to offer but how many people know about it you know we should, should, should take it out you see so if we had the resources maybe we could do it every month you know what I say so, besides putting in my house, every, we, we like to use it for anywhere else. If you do have anything, of, please, Dr. Rolf Steller. <laughs> Let us know. Goethe Institute, perhaps? Um, hello. Hi. Thank oh. you so much for sharing with us today. Um, you know, sometimes when we collect records, you'll get like uh, very interesting stories that comes with it. Uh, do you have anything to share while collecting these records? Something maybe from a bag, that bag that you're carrying? <laughs> Actually, there are a lot of rec uh, stories to share. It's not to do with the records, but to do with something else. Uh, there was, okay, I'll tell you a story that it's nothing to do with records, but the records led me to that place. Um, I had a very good friend, Jack Fazil, a fantastic bass player. He passed away. He passed away and he had instruments and he had old photographs, he had uh, amplifiers and all that. And when he passed away, we said, okay, you know, he's gone. Then we heard Dane took his things. So we thought, Dane is also a good musician because Dane was his cousin, finished, that's it. And then after Dane passes away, so what happened to all his equipment and all his photographs and everything? One day, Daryl Gall sends me an email and says, hey, listen, this guy uh, in Sungai Petani has a radiogram for sale. And if you buy the radiogram, you can also take all his records. So he's got hundreds of records, old records you can take. And this, like, this was posted up like about three, four months before I finally looked at it. And I said, okay, I'll call the guy. And the guy said, yeah, come. So I said, okay, on one of our trips back to KL, we went up and we stopped in Sungai Petani. And we went to the house, there was nobody there. Then the owner's son came with the wife and they showed us the things and all that. And it was very bad condition. The, the radiogram was very bad condition. The records were all, all over the place. They were put in buckets of water and everything. It's not that, you know, if we take it, there's a lot of work to do with it. 
So in the end, it was like, okay, I wasted my time, like, you know. Then, but anyway, I decided to talk to the boy and I said, actually, why we are doing this? Because we are trying to keep alive the memory of Ahmad Marikan, you know, Ahmad Daud, Zainal Alam, David Ng, and all these guys. And he said, well, Ahmad Daud, Ahmad Daud is my father's cousin or whatever, you know. And he started talking and he says, you know, oh, Din is my father's cousin as well. I said, Din? I said, you mean Din the uh, Peppers Cluster? He said, yeah, Din, Din, sir. So I said, okay. So that means Din is your father's cousin. That means Jack is also related to you. He said, yeah, Uncle Jackie, Uncle Jackie. Uh, he died already. All his guitar, all in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so I went inside the house. His guitars were there. His amplifiers, his photographs, everything was there. You know, but it was true something else that, you know, that brought us there. And there's a lot of stories like that, actually. You know, but we got not enough time. La. You buy me coffee, I tell you. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I was just wondering, out of the 10,000 records you've collected, is there one or a couple that really stands out for you as being like, wow, I can't believe I found this, and it's like really rare, and it's, it really stands out for you? And uh, why? And why? Not one, I think. Well, certainly not one, but a couple maybe. Yeah, there are a few of them that actually, you know, uh, like the the Hokkien one that we found, the the the, the, the Garaku, and then the Malaysian, the 1961 Malaya recording. And then the, there's even the Marymount one also. I like that one because it talks about Malaysia, Brunei being part of Malaysia. You know, that you know, Tunku even announces it very confidently. You know, uh, there are there are quite a few lah. I won't say one lah. Every time you think, okay, this is the one I got, then somebody else comes and says, yeah, I got this now. It's like Nagaraku. Nagaraku, why, the reason why we took it is basically it's the choir with Tony Soleno playing piano. And I've never seen it. It's usually orchestra, police band, army band, anything else, but never a solo piano playing with an orchestra. So that puts questions in my mind. Was it the first recording ever to be done that they recorded this and then after that they go out and then people have to listen to this and learn how to sing the Nagaraku? Or maybe that time they couldn't get the musicians, they haven't written the score yet for the orchestration of the song. So there are more questions that keep coming back all the time. You know, so I wouldn't say one, but every time we find many more lah, that it comes up, it never stops. Hi. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in the interest of uh, research and, you know, because it's all about data collections and, you know, getting up about stories and everything. So considering like uh, time moves on and people who's involved with this music are probably like, you know, at a very old people. And mm. um, so the efforts have to be like being very fast and uh, continuous. And like you said just now, if you have the fundings that you would have to like do a lot of things that you want, you would want. So I'm wondering, like, um, do you collaborate with any um, organizations or other parties internationally, or even from locals that have the same ambitions or or objective to to do this together with you? Is there anyone else doing this with you, or or, or with the Penang House of Music? Uh, in terms of recording and, and archiving of this, I don't very sure. But in terms of collaborating, yes, we collaborate. We collaborate with, uh, we started this and all that by ourselves, but we worked with the next state museum. Then after that, Think City came into it, which is a kazana. You know, and then they gave us the, the funding to do the book. And after the book, when uh, the uh, PBA, Penang Water Department asked, you know, what are you going to do with this? And they said, okay, put together a proposal. And because we wanted only a small place to put a resource center, in the end it developed into quite a 6,800 square feet area. Then we have a resource center, we have a black box, we have a gallery. So uh, we do work with other people as well because you cannot do this work on your own. That's just too much, you know, that's just too much. The people that work in our place are all younger than us, a lot of them. And sometimes it's, they still refer back to me, but I wish that more people around my time would know because I don't have to explain, okay, this guy is so and so and so and so, is it? Whereas the older guys will immediately pick up, I know who this is, you know, or, you know, the younger fella will not know. And it takes a process of teaching, you know, okay, this person is who, why is he important, what did he do? You know, um, 
I think that's that's what we need to do, like, You know, we work with everybody. If somebody else comes out a younger, you know, take upon something and say you want to do something else, and then we collaborate. Whatever you have, we share with you. Whatever you have, we share with us. At the end of the day, we want it to be shared with everybody else. Yes, we will work with everybody, anybody and everybody, so long as we don't come out money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know we we use the we had to buy this this uh, software Lucidia you know actually it's Sydney you know the pro where you put it down and then you have to go into like you said what what you mean is actually basically how you you merge them all together and all that kind of stuff is it or just just putting it by themselves yeah. Uh, that one I don't know how to do lah. Seriously, I, yeah. It could be, yeah. You know, we have we have our usual, you know, Instagram, Facebook stuff, and social media. There's a guy that's talking to us about doing more than that, but you know, at the end of the day, it's still about money. So we'll see. We we are not saying no, but you know, we have to just spend it wisely because it's not a big pool of things that that will last forever. You know, and uh, we have to maintain and try and go slow on it as well. But if you have any 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 thing that you would like to share on how to do it, let me know. <laughs> At this point in time, not at the moment because uh, uh, we have enough stuff, but we have for part timers and all that. If people like to do part time, because what we do is that we we now we do receive uh, university interns coming to our place, and um, what we do is we teach them about first the gallery guide. They have to know about what the music is all about before you. I don't want somebody to just sit down and just key in things and key in things without knowing what you're keying in. It's no use. You're not learning. You're not processing yourself. You know, and and uh, you know, I would. We we do hope to have lah. You know, in, eventually, but it depends on how much and all that lah. <laughs> yes, yeah, you. Okay. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoy yourself.